Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's University Life Forum entitled Racial Justice, The Chauvin Trial and Beyond. I'm Dennis Mitchell, Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement here at Columbia University. And I must begin today by reminding us all, most importantly, to say his name, George Floyd, the father, the son, the brother, and the grandfather who was murdered by Derek Chauvin while his colleagues looked on. Sadly, we have seen this before. This is not the first time a police officer has murdered an unarmed black American. We have seen the grim footage, nine minutes and 29 seconds of it captured entirely by a 17 year old who happened to be there, who knew that it was their duty to document this because the account of a white police officer in cases like this is seldom questioned because the very institution of policing in the United States has its origins in slave patrols, in enforcement of black codes, and in Jim Crow era lynchings. We cannot overlook the political backdrop of America in May of last year, or for the last four years prior to that, where we had a president who built his political platform on delegitimizing the first black American president dehumanizing black and brown Americans, who himself weaponized the US Park Police and National Guard troops to tear gas a crowd of protesters, who used the word like thugs to describe activists in the Black Lives Matter movement, who exalted a white teenager wielding an AR-15, who was thanked by police and given a bottle of water before killing two protesters, a president who praised the white couple standing guns at the ready as peaceful protesters walked by in an effort to protect their possessions. This president galvanized an ugly racist part of America in his effort to reclaim their country, to make America great again. Unfortunately, this is as old as our nation. We also cannot overlook the pandemic and its disproportionate impact on communities of color. We had experienced over 100,000 American deaths at that moment. Now it's well over half a million, as well as the ripple effect of the devastation to their loved ones. In 2020, we were already all numb before this tragedy because to feel all of this pain would completely immobilize us. When the footage of Derek Chauvin's knee on the neck of George Floyd aired again and again and again, there was a captive audience of onlookers around the world stuck home and glued to our televisions and our computer screens in horror. Is this what it takes to get people to acknowledge our humanity? The black, that black lives do matter? The movement's allies, those who have been doing racial justice work for years, watched on weary as we witnessed the performative outrage, protest selfies, corporations standing in solidarity. Then the spotlight fades and our Twitter feeds forget and we move on to the nation's next shiny object that distracts us. The actions of Derek Chauvin on May 25th, 2020 have set in motion a worldwide call. There were protests on every continent and Colombia was also listening. Our imperfect institution built by slaves and originally run by slave owners whose names have been displayed prominently in our buildings has its own work to do. When those in our community feel erased and unheard, we must first acknowledge their truth and witness their pain before pointing toward policies and procedures that offer little solace. I can say that we are committed to doing the hard work and we are heartened that the university leadership is with us. And though we have much ground to cover, we remain hopeful as we await the verdict. We have faculty panelists in a broad cross section of disciplines with us to offer their perspectives on the trial and its implications for the future. 
I am pleased to welcome this afternoon my colleague, Carmela Alcantara, Associate Professor, Associate Dean for Doctoral Education, Columbia University School of Social Work. Farah Jasmine Griffin, Chair, Department of African, Amer African American and African Diasporic Studies, the William B. Ransford Professor of English and Comparative Literature and African American and, and American Studies and Professor of African American and African Diasporic Studies. Bernard Harcourt, the Isidore and Seville Sulbacher Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science at Columbia University. And our moderator this afternoon, Yosef Soret, Prof Professor and Chair, Department of Religion, Professor, Department of African American and African Diasporic Studies. It is my pleasure to turn it this afternoon over to you, Yosef. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Thank you for joining us, Dennis. Thank you for setting the mood so powerfully and for creating the space for this conversation, both to your office and the Office of University Life. And uh, thank you to my panelists this day, who I feel the privilege and opportunity to learn from uh, this afternoon. I think, Dennis, you have already, in such a clear and powerful way, um, clarified the context and as well as the stakes of this conversation, that what we are thinking about is, of course, centered around a trial in a particular place at this moment in time, but we're also thinking about so much more. We're thinking about questions and problems that are far reaching around the world and that also hit us closest to home even in the context of the institution of Columbia University. And I very much appreciate the reminder that we are of course, first and foremost, thinking about lives lost and lives taken. George Floyd, Dante Wright, but a longer list, even just over the past year that is too long to enumerate. I wanna recognize the complexity of questions that all of the panelists uh, might help us think through as well as that might come with our audience to this conversation. That when we ask questions of this trial, of its proceedings, of whatever verdicts might be rendered, that we are of course thinking about the courts and the law more broadly. We are thinking about policing and the criminal justice system and a longer histories of trials that resemble the one before us. And we are of course thinking about a wider history of race and racism and white supremacy and of the conditions of black life that emerge in response to and in the context of these questions. And then we are also thinking about American democracy and what all of this might mean for the future of this nation and the world. As I said already, I feel so fortunate that we have such incredible colleagues on the panel here to help us lead in this conversation, who bring a range of expertises that uh, help to open up our conversation in new ways um, and to get at, and if not answer, help us refine the questions that we bring to the table today. I wanna begin um, by just opening up a general question to each of them and invite them to respond in however they say fit from their own experiences and expertise. And then we might have a follow-up round uh, that gestures in the direction of their more specific expertise. And then we'll see where we go from there. I know we're uh, also uh, in light of questions that have been submitted in advance and that may also come by way of the chat eager to engage uh, in Q&A as the program proceeds. So the first question uh, that I would just ask, and we'll move in alphabetical order to begin. Uh, so, so Carmela, I'd ask you to be the first, and then uh, Professor Griffin, and then Professor Harcourt. Uh, the first question is just simply, uh, what does this trial uh, mean to you? Or what do you think it means for us in light of your own experience? Why is it so important beyond just the courtroom in which it's being held? And, and um, please, I'll just stop there and open it up. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yosef, for the opportunity to participate on this panel. And, and also, you know, I, I, I can imagine the great effort uh, it took the university to put this together during such uh, um, constraints on time. And uh, again, I'm, I'm here uh, to offer sort of my perspective and I think to clarify questions. I think most of us are ourselves, um, uh, 
particularly, I think, you know, those who identify as Black or Indigenous and people of color really uh, trying to uh, both cope with the trial, process the trial, and then look ahead um, and beyond towards broader implications. Um, I mean, I, I see it and I, I think, you know, Dr. Mitchell did such a great job and, and, and provided such a powerful statement that historicizes what this trial means and, and the events and, and um, histories that have led to where we are today. But as um, I see it, it feels like a moment of reckoning, a moment of, with anti-Black racism, with the killing of George Floyd, with, you know, killing of countless other Black bodies, uh, Breonna Taylor. So it's, it's about George Floyd and yet it's about so much more. Um, uh, and a moment also of accountability, sort of public accountability and uh, responsibility in ways that uh, we haven't seen before or that you know typically um, it, uh, most of these cases will be, uh, have not proceeded to a, a court trial. Uh, so um, it's, I think, um, historic for uh, that moment. I, you, you asked a couple of critical um, points. I know um, in relation to how I'm experiencing uh, this moment as you know, black identified Latina and psychologist, it's this interesting, I find myself thinking a lot about um, public health and also mental health. And I, I think we'll probably touch upon that later, but it's this interesting um, process of how, you know, do you cope with the three weeks of trial proceedings and, and, and testimony uh, that have happened and, and obviously um, uh, deep interest and care with what happens uh, with the, the outcome of this trial and also the implications of it while at the same time managing self-care. I mean, so many of the conversations I've had with uh, colleagues and students has been around this sense of exhaustion um, uh, that is only compounded by you know, recent events like uh, Dante Wright's killing and now Adam Toledo. Um, so it's been, you know, again, I think it's been a strategic um, or careful balance between engaging really deeply with the, the, the proceedings and the testimonies and at the same time bal balancing and, and understanding the importance of, of radical self-care in, you know, in, uh, in these very um, acute moments. Um, I'll, I'll sort of stop there because I, I think we'll have an uh, opportunity to elaborate uh, more. Excellent, thank you so much, Professor Alcantara. Professor Griffin. Thank you, uh, Yosef, and, and I um, echo uh, what my colleagues have said. Um, this feels like a moment with a, both a deep familiarity, but also something different. Um, I, I have, um, you know, what happened with Derek Chauvin and George Floyd is not new. It has happened my entire life. Um, very rarely has it ended up in a trial of a police officer, very rarely. And um, almost always those officers are let off when, when it happens. Um, so I think what I bring to it is that sense of deep history, both as a scholar and personally. Um, and both a, a sort of war within myself to not have expectation, um, not have the expectation of justice. Um, uh, and yet um, sitting on the edge of my seat with a sense of hopefulness every single time, hopefulness, and always looking at what um, might be different this time. Um, but I think, you know, it used to be, well, surely everyone saw. <laughs> that used to be the difference. Everyone saw. <laughs> and since Rodney King, I've, I've let that go because we don't see the same things. Um, and so always looking for what might be different that might lead us in the way of justice. And in this time, certainly the uprising, the people in the streets, the global attention, um, where for the first time it didn't feel like people of African descent were so alone in this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with this trial, um, even though, you know, the, the whole question of self-care um, with this trial, as I would say, I can't watch it, <laughs> but I had to watch it. <laughs> um, and seeing something different in the trial. And that's the, you know, the sort of police officers and the representatives of the state saying this was wrong. And so that lending a sense of hopefulness 
um, that maybe there will be a fairness here. And yet, you know, wanting to maintain my skepticism, my sense of reality, um, as if, you know, so that I, I can say that no matter what happens, I won't be disappointed, knowing that that's not true. <laughs> so um, that's what I think, I, that's what I feel, a kind of both and um, set of experiences. Absolutely, thank you so much, Farah. Bernard. Thank you, uh, and I'm, 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 uh, thanks for uh, hosting this and moderating this, and I'm so uh, warm to be with you all, and Farah, uh, Carmela, Joseph, Yosef, and I hope that we can go with first names rather than professors. Um, so I've, I've, I've tried to watch this through uh, different lenses, and, and one of the most powerful ones uh, was actually a video on the New York Times that they put up yesterday, I think, which was watching the trial through the eyes with the families of uh, other, uh, other police uh, shootings and beatings. Um, and uh, for those who haven't watched it, I think it's, 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 an, it's, it's a really important, uh, uh, it's a really important experience. It's actually a video that watches the trial through the eyes of the, the daughter of Rodney King, as you were, you were talking about uh, Rodney King's beating Farah, and through the eyes of the uh, mother of Oscar Grant, uh, who, as you remember, was killed at uh, Fruitvale Station, and, and the mother and grandmother of Stefan Clark, uh, who were killed in 2018. And in experiencing, watching the trial in their, in their living rooms with their families, and the trauma and the um, difficulty of that is simply, is simply harrowing. And I think in part, it, it is through those eyes that I have also tried to experience personally uh, the trial itself. Um, but it, and, 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 uh, and, and all of these uh, interventions that you've been making about a, a, a reckoning and accountability um, uh, Carmela, as you were talking about, and the trauma, and also Farah about the deep familiarity and 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 the rareness of this actually taking place. I think I, I agree with fully, I, but I also experience it with a deep sense of frustration, um, and um, and it, it's that frustration I think that is lingering, that I'm unable to. Uh, get rid of it's it's this in part it's this frustration I, I view this personally as as someone who's been a death penalty lawyer representing folks on death row for decades now and uh, and the representation of this trial uh, is so off <laughs> of what the criminal legal ordeal is really like in this country um, the the way in which uh, this is the process that uh, Chauvin is receiving is so radically different than the kind of trials that I deal with where my clients are sentenced to death within two days. I mean, from jury selection to death penalty hearings that last 19 minutes with just one mother giving monosyllabic unprepared responses and a death sentence that results the next day. Uh, to watch this and to think that Americans are getting the impression that this is what the criminal justice system is like yeah. is, is just, is for me so painful and frustrating. Um, when in fact, what we're talking about are rooms filled with African-American young men who are chained together in jumpsuits and mostly taking pleas en masse, right? Right. 95, 99% of, of American criminal legal process is this plea enforcement against uh, young uh, African-American Latinx young men, right? And it's just this, this image that we're giving ourselves as if this was the criminal justice or, you know, criminal legal or I call it a criminal legal ordeal. We used to call it the criminal legal system, but whatever you want to call it, this is not what we are dealing with today. And that is a sense of frustration that I have that I just don't know what to do with, you mm -hmm. know? Um, in part because even though this trial is so important in terms of accountability and responsibility, um, it's a distraction from 
the larger movement for black lives, I feel mm. in many ways. Mm. And, and, um, and that's something I, I hope we'll, we'll get to talk about uh, during this time together. Absolutely. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you so much for that. Um, I guess I want to come right back to you to ask a follow up question. I appreciate the sort of reframing of the courtroom in that regard, right? That what we're seeing is not typical order, right? This is in fact an inversion of the kind of injustice that is very much embedded and structured in the criminal legal criminal justice system. And I, so I very much appreciate that reframing. I, I guess I also um, want to ask a question and ask maybe if there were some guidance you might give us and, and the viewers, right? I think about the various kinds of expertise I might bring to viewing the film. It's not legal expertise, right? In the sort of expectations we might have of a verdict either way, I wonder like what, from a, from a legal framework, what sort of things should we be thinking about as we're all waiting for a verdict that we're hopeful, but also have a certain kind of reasoned expectation wherever we lay on these things. So I wonder if there might be some sort of legal guidance that you might be able to give to those who've tuned in both around thinking about charges and the verdicts and the implications uh, mm -hmm. within uh, yeah, the context of the courts. Well, sure, I can play the, you know, <laughs> lawyer for a moment, although I, I hope that we'll, we'll get past that quickly because I think the issues here are larger than legal in a sense, but there are, there are three counts here, which effectively are different ways of characterizing the homicide. Um, and it is actually, it's actually presented in an odd way to the public that there are, there are three counts, because in fact, what there are are three different ways of understanding what the homicide was. And they're different, in other words, so it's, it's <laughs> and they're, they're lesser included in a sense. I mean, there's second degree murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. And the, the first one, which is the most severe second degree murder is actually what's called felony murder. So it's murder during the course of a felony where the, the felony here is assault. Uh, that's the maximum uh, charge, you know, it would, could carry a 40 year maximum, although here it would probably carry a 12 year sentence. But it's also a charge that really doesn't fit very well because there's this kind of bootstrapping element. I mean, of course, if he was committing an assault, he was committing a homicide. I mean, it's, there's this bootstrapping that, and the prosecution wasn't very happy with it. So they were, they were pleased when a higher court allowed them to introduce the second charge, which is third degree murder. And that is basically kind of someone who invinces a depraved mind. So it's the, the mens rea, the mental state there is one of kind of depravity, extreme dangerousness, uh, acting extremely dangerous with a depraved mind. And that's what's called murder, third degree. And then, and then the third charge is, is a manslaughter charge, which is basically a form of recklessness. And so the difference really has to do with the mental state of the defendant and, um, and, 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 but what's odd in the way it's being presented is that these are presented as if uh, you would be guilty, of, he should be guilty of all three when really it, they are lesser included offenses, which means that, you know, there's one is more grave than the other. And if you were convicted of one, you would naturally, of course, have been reckless. Uh, you know, if you were, if you have a depraved mind, of course, you're, rec you're reckless. But in any event, that's the, those are, those are the verdicts and, and those are the possible verdicts and uh, from a, from a kind of strictly legal perspective. And I appreciate your patience in, in answering the question. I too want to get to, to some of the, uh, to, to the larger questions and sort of what this means for us all. And I'll pivot here to you, Carmela, to ask a question that sort of invites uh, drawing on your own expertise and thinking about race and difference in mental health or what have you, right? As I was, I'm not one who likes to watch these trials as a practice of self-care, uh, but someone else pointed out to me, well, you're moderating this panel, maybe you should watch something, right? And immediately I found myself holding my chest, not even three minutes in as I'm being subjected to every angle of police camera, right? Body cameras, right? Which is part of a conversation on police reform, but I wonder, Sort of, I think also of the context of so many of the conversations that come up in our classroom and our students are struggling with this 
they're, they're watching this while they're now moving through finals, right? But so I guess I wonder as one who works in the space of mental health, balancing the self-care with the engagement, sort of uh, what, what sort of recommendations or what sort of thoughts do you have from in that vantage point that, yeah. Yeah, Yosef, th thanks for opening a space to, to talk about that. I think the, the first thing I would want to say is just to validate that what you're feeling has been, you know, found and documented and across many different kinds of, of studies that vicarious exposure to trauma, to, 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 um, to racism, and uh, particularly for, you know, BIPOC folks has a real acute physiological effect that then later impacts your, uh, your mental health, your physical health. So it's, it's real. I think that, I think acknowledging um, that, you know, acknowledging and, and validating that even the experience of watching the video and watching the trial does have an impact on, on your mental health and on your physical health, I think is an, um, is, is an important point and, and not a minor point. I think it's, it's a really um, uh, major um, point. And so I do, you know, I do have some thoughts about um, ways to minimize that, but I, but on this point, I also want to say that it's not, you know, the, this Chauvin trial and the larger racial justice uprisings related to George Floyd's killing and, and the other um, killings that we have referred to here of um, Black people is, is serving as a backdrop for some, like, change that's happening at, at a broad level. And so I just want to bring our, you know, call our attention that just last week, the Centers for Disease Control declared racism a threat to public health. I mean, that's huge. I mean, for those of us who do health disparities research where that, you know, where for decades, the, the impact of racism in, in particular has been shown in terms of the impacts of racism on health, the fact that now there are, um, that there's national, I think, recogni recognition of that impact is, is really quite um, remarkable. Um, and other, you know, dedicated efforts to think about the impact of structural racism on health and, and you know, scientific processes. So it, it is having a larger effect. You know, this is where the beyond piece, I think, comes, uh, mm -hmm. comes into play, that it, it is the trial, but then there's a lot of, um, uh, ways in which we're contending with anti-Black racism within other institutions and structures. And I, I think that that's, I, I think that that deserves um, some discussion uh, as well. Um, I think, you know, there, there's been other great research to show that there are like spillover mental health effects from it being exposed to community trauma and that those effects are more um, pronounced for Black individuals. So that again, sort of this witnessing uh, and re-experiencing of uh, George Floyd's killing and the and the bystander um, uh, and you know witness uh, testimony does have an impact on mental health and so thinking about you know self care from the perspective of minimizing those triggers and I think a lot of us have referred to this. It, don't want to watch that war, Barry. You said that term that that um, war, and I think re reflecting on that that Chenton, I think is really um, uh, 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 in, in important. So I think it, you know minimizing triggers again, really thinking about how um, uh, uh, self care is is incredibly critical during this. A moment, I think, thinking about healing. So in the circles that I'm a part of, really, there's been a sense um, of uh, like, how are you going to take care uh, with, you know, my um, Black identified friends and colleagues about like, how are you going to take care of yourself? What does healing look like in this community? What is reparative in this moment? What does reparative work in this moment look like for you? And really acknowledging and validating that it is you know, this, this trial, the moment that we end the, the, this historical period does have a physical and mental impact uh, on us. I think that validation is, is um, and, and to know that there is evidence that actually backs that up is really uh, important. Thank you so much, Carmela. I want, I mean, build on that question of self-care and turning back to you, Farah. And, I'm, you know, I immediately, when I think of my own sort of practices, immediately the, the arts, music, right, the sort of traditions, right, that point to the fact that nothing about this current moment is novel, in, right, and that at the same time, uh, that irrespective of what happens in the courtroom, what the courtroom does is not even provide us a glimpse of the set of strategies and practices within the context of Black communities that have sustained us over the long haul. And so I, thinking about your work, I, I was, you know, I was recalling 
Richard Eiton's notion of a black fantastic, sort of a recognition of the inability of the state to affirm the fullness of black lives. And I wonder like sort of where within your own work on arts and activism and sort of how does that figure in this current conversation that is just so preoccupied with a courtroom? Well, I think it figures greatly. I mean, I, you know, one of the things that at first looks like an irony, um, but actually the relationship is, you know, evident is that um, in these moments of heightened awareness, and I would say heightened awareness, not heightened violence, because the whole history is violent, right? Um, and, and what Bernard said, the everyday of those young men in those orange jumpsuits and, you know, those of us who have been in those courtrooms as family members, as daughters, as, you know, sons, as spouses. Um, there is an everydayness to it. Um, so what is heightened in this moment is a heightened awareness of it. And that that awareness um, comes from, you know, one, the films, you know, that young woman, Darnella Frazier, who is traumatized by this, filming it, and the witnesses, and I don't mean, I don't mean the trial witnesses um, only, but before they were witnesses on trial, they, they were bearing witness um, to George Floyd's life and murder. Um, they were also participants in a community where they were just going about their day, doing their daily thing. <laughs> and they um, encountered this, right? That, that that's a reality. And I think our arts have always documented that reality, um, whether it's, you know, over a hundred years of novels um, and music and hip hop lyrics and that they've always documented that. And in the process of documenting it and of, um, of bearing witness, they've also provided a space where a people can reckon that we are more than, we are more than this abjection, right? Um, that we are, we are, we are a community. We are a, a people with a history and a set of traditions and a set of rituals for dealing with those traditions. And so much of that art um, that we celebrate that has nourished the world is an art recognizing um, the violence of our deaths and the prematurity of our deaths. Um, and so that there is a relationship. And I, I would say this finally, I think that um, there is in these moments of heightened awareness, there is also, these are also moments of heightened cultural production. Um, and, you know, more stories being told to bear witness to this, more songs being written, more ways of coming together as a community. Um, there is a relationship between gathering for um, verses <laughs> or gathering for um, D nice right, that are not just about partying, but that are about healing as community and coming together in a ritual of togetherness. So it's there throughout the, all of this cultural history. Um, Absolutely, and that right, in, in the form over the last year of the novel technologies from cl Club Quarantine to yes. the various ways in which our families have forged spaces across Zoom, yes. um, sort of making a way out of no way. That, right, um, right. And I think which one of the things that resonated with what Carmela said is when, you know, with these trials, as with, um, you know, from, from the Zimmerman trial, you know, checking in. How are you doing? Are you watching this? Maybe you shouldn't, you know, checking on our elders who have seen this forever, right? Um, maybe you shouldn't watch it. I'll tell you if there's something you need to know. You know who's going to be the witness, right? Um, that will then share and communicate what they see. Absolutely. Um, so there's, I, there's comment in the chat space uh, that it appears that the verdict will be forthcoming any moment now, or, or, though, or shortly after we finish. Just want to acknowledge that, even as we continue to keep a larger set of questions uh, at the forefront of our conversation. I guess maybe. Uh, one of the set of questions that came in in some of the, the chat, and we can think of the degree to which we've bombarded, been bombarded with so many overlapping sets of issues that have all sort of been enfolded on, in a response to, to say um, something like it's sort of anti-racist project, right? The university has stepped us in this regard, but we can, from, from the disproportionate impact of COVID that's been mentioned earlier to the 
anti to the racist discourse that runs through immigration legislation to the more recent sort of conversation both about anti-Asian racism versus anti-Black racism. I, I wonder, and I open this up to the panel as a whole about sort of how, whether in the context of what we do on campus, but also in the context of our own lives and in your own work, how do we think about these things together in ways that don't reduce them, but also um, are also possibilities for finding space to work together, right? Um, yeah, just a sort of general way, how do we think about the various registers in which racist discourse has been manifest in physical violence, but also uh, at the level of rhetoric and, and where and how do we respond together? And that's to the panel as a whole to jump in in any way as you see fit. Well, I think that, you know, one thing about this moment is that it does seem to be providing the opportunity for people across um, an ideological spectrum and a various kinds of, to, to, to talk about, to have a conversation, even if we don't agree, <laughs> uh, what we can agree on is the moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I found shocking, for instance, and Yosef, you would have been aware of this, was Pat Robertson. This is a, yes. <laughs> right? Like, I'm like, really? You know? Um, and so, uh, and, and I'm, I'm like, if, you, if you're willing to speak, I'm willing to listen. You know, I want to hear what you have to say about this. And so that I think if we could, you know, this might be a moment where we could actually have this kind of conversation where the things that Bernard raised, like while you're looking, since you're interested in this, try. Um, let's talk about what it really looks like, right? What it normally looks like. And I think that we, 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 we're going up against a kind of media world, which is all about kind of grab attention, get ratings, this is exciting, this is titillating, that really doesn't allow for the kinds of necessary discussions. Um, and that seems to substitute for those, but that the moment provides an opportunity, at least when we have each other's attention, to perhaps have the very difficult, difficult conversation across difference about one thing we can agree upon is that this happened, that these attacks on Asian people are happening that, um, you know, and so if we can agree on that, that's a, that's a fact, not an opinion, then let's have a conversation about why and let's have a conversation about what to do about it. Absolutely, and of course, Professor Griffin was making mention of Pat Robertson, who as much as any figure uh, through his media network, Christian Broadcasting Network, helped to usher in the kind or re-usher in the kind of white Christian nationalism that has been front and center over the last several years, that if Pat Robertson is acknowledging uh, the wrong of police, anti-Black police violence, then certainly there might be a space for a different kind of conversation. I don't know if I, either of the other panelists want to respond to this general question. Also in the context, I think, Bernard, of sort of racial justice organizing that you were speaking of across these spaces, yeah. Right, well, I mean, in part, you know, the, the, the tragedy of these police killings is so, extensive and so great and reaches into so many different communities um, that uh, I think inevitably it brings uh, it brings movements together and so tragic the tragic death of Adam uh, Toledo um, in Chicago uh, 13 year old mm -hmm. uh, young boy um, is is kind of you know is the way is tragically the way in which uh, these 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 movements in different uh, sections of the movement against police violence can, can work together do work together um, uh, in, in in that that was a very different community that was affected in Chicago uh, on uh, in uh, in Little Village um, and 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 so that has tragically I mean. You know the the numbers are so overwhelming here. While while the Chauvin trial has been going on, the drumbeat has continued. We're talking about three police sh fatal shootings a day. We, we we knew this. I mean, we since we've started to record this more um, well. So around 2015, basically, when the Washington Post and the Guardian started trying to keep statistics, I mean, we became aware of the, you know, over a thousand uh, shooting deaths a year by the police. And, and that really, that's, what that means is that 
the, the, the victims, it's, it's, it's a broad swath of the, of, of, of mostly uh, communities of color, but, uh, but that then brings together lots of different uh, protest movements and, and communities uh, to, to work together and not to view this as a kind of in any way a, a competition of trauma, but rather working together uh, to, to try and address these wrongs. Absolutely, thank you, Bernard. Carmela, did you wanna jump in here as well or? Yeah, I think the, the other um, thought I'd contribute to this is just the, the need to make it local or sort of bring it back home. And I think that's an important you know, piece of the conversation. This is all, I think to, to Farah's point about it, it's you know, hyper attention that, you know, by the, the media on the Chauvin trial and the implications, but we know that this larger work and the, the importance of coalition building and building, building you know, solidarity across um, communities, both white identified and BIPOC communities, so essential to, to actually making meaningful and sustained um, changes, uh, you know, towards dismantling white supremacy. But that's, that's, that's work that's national and also like very local. And I think, mm -hmm. I think we all have a, 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 res, a responsibility in, in really bringing, bringing this, uh, these discussions that are on topics that have the national attention, but bringing it down and really focusing it to that micro, uh, that micro and that very local uh, level. Because though that work is indeed being done at the local level across lines of difference, absolutely. So I want to thank folks who are um, offering questions in the q and I want to lift one up to the panel that speaks to bringing things home local in another context, uh, back to where uh, Vice Provost Mitchell br brought us at the beginning of the conversation. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, what might appear as bias and that this question comes from a, a student uh, in the religion department. Um, so thank you, Zara, and, uh, for this wonderful question who, uh, and I'll just rehearse it here. Um, how does one engage with the experience of living discrimination and violence in the, within the space of universities, uh, which, may, which it may seem remain oblivious to their own histories of violence, right? So, so uh, in Zara's reading, Columbia writes itself out of the, its his own history of racism. How do we engage critically with questions of responsibility and the experience of race within the space of university. I think Provost Mitchell has helped signal the ways in which Columbia is taking up this work. Um, and I can think of other you know, sort of course offerings and projects that do do this at the space and, and the university. I wonder in your own, uh, you know, across the university in arts and science at the law school at school of social work, how you see yourself or, or have thoughts on ways in which uh, members of the Columbia community can do this work within the context of the institution that we currently work at and live at and study at. In whatever order you wanna jump in, that's fine. <laughs> well, I would say that, um, you know, I, I thank the student for that question, um, that, uh, you know, one thing about university communities is that we are made up of various units and, collections and collectives and um, that there are oftentimes, you know, the very critique that we see embedded in that question is also being taken up in a number of different contexts at the university itself. Um, and, you know, whether it's in individual scholarship <laughs> um, with people who are looking at Columbia's role, say, in creating, you know, for instance, the Dunning School of History, um, right? Um, yep kind of apologist for slavery. And then, and that same department creating a revision of how we looked at reconstruction that called our attention to what was problematic there. That um, I would say the universities are places of contestation and that um, you can genuinely find um, those arguments, those debates in various corners. Um, there are conversations going on right now. I know Dennis is involved in them. I'm involved in them about processes for allowing our community to talk about who do we recognize? How do we recognize them? What do we memorialize? How do we memorialize it? And so I think the kind of pushing that I see in that question is one that we welcome from students because we're, you know, there are always people trying to create venues for those conversations. Bernard and I have been involved in some of them as well through the Just Society. So 
I think I think that there are various venues where those debates and conversations are happening and they need to happen more and they need to include, be more inclusive and include more part, larger parts of our community. Absolutely. This is something, I'll just sort of jump in here. Uh, I don't, and, and Farah, that was so, um, it was so insightful. Um, I think what I find myself reflecting and in the school of social work, we've been doing a lot of thinking and talking about this as we um, really think about addressing issues of anti-Black racism in, in our curriculum and, and you know, um, anti-oppressive practices uh, through the board. And I, I think what I find myself reflecting on is that this is a constant process that requires constant like pressure, <laughs> you know, and so, which is not, um, I don't know if that's a, a hopeful message, but I, I think it's, um, I think it's, I think it's messy. I think it's not linear. I think in some ways that, you know, one of the most helpful insights I heard recently in a, in a training is how, you know, institutions are made up of people. And so, you know, people can, uh, change and there can be changes. I think the rate of change might might look a bit different, but it does require this sense of constant pressure. And I I, I do want to and, and thank you, Yosef, for uplifting a, a student question that uh, oftentimes that constant pressure comes from students as well um, and can be used to effectively make uh, changes and to have you know create spaces for contestation and, and challenge within the university and that students really do play a critical role in that. Yeah, I would, I would echo that, and um, and 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 just emphasize how much it is ultimately a question of each of our responsibility to challenge, to challenge our own dark histories uh, and the dark histories of institutions of which we are a part, and um, and I think that uh, Zehra is you're doing that right now. Uh, and, and that's critical. Uh, and we all need to be doing that and, and posing the difficult questions. We, we have a tendency at these institutions of, about, about truth of getting, of not sufficiently challenging uh, truth and authority. Um, and, and I think that's our greatest task. And so I thank Zira Mehdi for, for raising that and for challenging us to do that all the time. Absolutely, and she is indeed also helping us do that within the local level of the department. So I'm glad to see she's here and bringing that conversation as I know so many other uh, students are doing. So um, a couple more questions are being coming in. I'm also receiving uh, confirmation that we do, we'll, we will get through this panel before a verdict. The verdict is now I'm being told will be read between 4.30 and 5.00. I want to ask, I think I have time for one more round of questions uh, or one question that we might each offer a response and I'll ask it in a particular way, but as always, I invite you all to, to go with whatever direction makes sense. And I'm very reluctant to, to, I don't want to think of this question as wrapping up our conversation in a bow. And I think in some ways, so much of what's already been said in this, is, it goes in this direction. But I wonder, you know, even as we're girding ourselves up for the verdict between a competing set of impulses and feelings. I wonder where in the midst of all this, uh, you all find, uh, and maybe this is part of the practices of self-care, the sources of hope, right? I think Farah's example of Pat Robertson was for me a sort of, right, unanticipated, right? If that space is shifting, maybe there is some hopefulness there, but then also the history of Columbia's history department that goes from, right, uh, offering an apologetic for slavery to documenting the institution's record, I think, Right, there are any number of spaces that I, I find at the local level, at the you know familial level, for spaces, spaces and sources of hope that move our conversation forward. I wonder where, for you, right, as folks who continue to do this work in the classroom and also in your lives, where you find uh, that that hope, or where might you point uh, to other examples that uh, might give uh, everyone in the conversation today, in the days ahead. Uh, spaces to turn as resources in this regard.
Well, maybe I'll kick it off. <laughs> Go ahead, Bernard. So, yeah. that, so that Farah and Carmela can be the last speakers and 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 orient us in the right direction. <laughs> um, so let me just tentatively say I I, I find hope in in uh, in in movements of protest and in uh, people coming together to challenge uh, to challenge authority and challenge truth. That's what I what I find hope. I do I do not I do not find hope in in the criminal legal ordeal, which was something that I was trying to kind of touch on at the beginning. I, I mean, the criminal legal ordeal is in a, in a large sense responsible for the mess we're in and for the, the racial injustices in this country. I mean, W.E.B. Du Bois said it very clearly back in 1935 in Black Reconstruction in America, how, you know, the South and, and, and the North, I mean, how whites turned to the criminal process as a way to re-enslave uh, freed uh, black men and women. It was chiefly through the criminal process, through convict leasing, through uh, criminalization to disenfranchise, through plantation prisons, et cetera, that, the, that, that we were able in this country to re-establish the racial hierarchy that exists here. That, the, that was, it was through the criminal devices and so, um, and so it's not in a, it's not by turning to the criminal uh, legal uh, process that I, uh, that I find hope. It's really in the, in the mass and the movements that have been going on, uh, you know, since so long, of course, civil rights movement, Black Panther movement, I mean, back in the 1950s and 60s, but the, the movement for Black Lives that's, that, that was triggered with uh, Eric Garner and the, in Ferguson, et cetera. And that has been so strong and so powerful. And that's where I see hope. And that's where I find uh, hope and comfort. Thank you, Bernard. I was gonna, I agree. Um, and and it, it, in the movements, um, in the communities, um, the ways that local communities respond, react, take care of each other, the kind of ethic of care that governs um, communities and that govern movements. And in the history of movements, um, I, I recently wrote a chapter that includes a story of, um, of you know, the, the multiracial group of abolitionists in Philadelphia, the city of my birth, and um, how bold they were <laughs> and imaginative and courageous. Um, and so that they're, they're, you know, that that these movements don't emerge without a history, um, and that so often we we have to document the history of the oppression and the violence. But there's all, always been um, movements in response to those things, and so I, I would agree. And I, I also have to say, having taught my last class um, mm. for the semester this year, is that I find hope in my students. You know, I, I um, who can imagine things that in my old cynical self <laughs> um, just can't even imagine, you know, that they, they not only can imagine them, they can live in ways that I, I could not have even thought possible. And so I find hope, I find hope there. Thank you, Farrah. Carmela. Yeah, those, uh, thank you both for those reflections. I, I, I really um, agree and those resonate with me. Um, Yosef, with this question, I found myself thinking about purpose more so than hope. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, how could, like, because th it feels like purpose is something we have more direct control over than hope. Uh, and so how could we use this opportunity to renew our sense of purpose in, you know, racial justice work? Um, so um, uh, that's a helpful frame for me, as is, I, I you know, I, I found myself reflecting on purpose, but I, Farah's point about um, students, and I think going back to that earlier point about constant um, pressure and, and being agents for change and, and seeing, um, envisioning possibilities that I, that I think are, is, is harder, I, I think, particularly when we're entrenched within these institutions. So I, I have to um, say I do find hope in, in thinking about the you know, current generation of, of, of students and scholars, but this piece about purpose, we, we can control, right? We can, we can control what we find purpose in. Um, uh, we can't control what the outcome of uh, a trial or other such uh, 
processes may be. Absolutely, I appreciate that reframing of the question. In fact, as, as you all were talking, I was sort of thinking about initially with Bernard's comment on the movement for black lives, I was you know, flashing back across now, right? Sustained, prominent, organized efforts that right, we think of as this movement going back to Eric Garner, Michael Brown and others up to the present day, I think of entering into the intro to African-American studies class in the immediate aftermath of that first summer of 2014 and the kind of purposefulness that the students were bringing, even as we often, not often, not unoften in that class found ourselves looking at each other, almost short on words, the kind of purpose, purposefulness they were bringing their, to their questions and to their desire and to their study too, towards the end of trying to reimagine and imagine a new world. So I think that is a fitting way to reframe as we you know, move from here uh, out from this conversation out, um, with purposefulness in mind for our studying, for our organizing, for our activism, for the work we wanna do in building a different kind of world. I wanna uh, hand it over back to University Life. Uh, I believe uh, Associate Vice President Ishelle Roselle will be giving us some final remarks, but I wanna of course thank the Office of University Life and the Office of the Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement, Dennis Mitchell, for bringing us together for this conversation. Uh, thank these panelists for helping to lead us forward in such powerful and clear ways. And thank you, Ishel, for uh, bringing us home. And thank you, Yusuf, <laughs> for moderating. Thank you, Yusuf. Um, I am Ishel Rosal with the Office of University Life, one of the sponsoring offices for this event. I want to thank today's panelists, Carmela Alcantara, Farah Jasmine Griffin and Bernard Harcourt for being part of today's conversation. I especially want to thank Yosef Saret for moderating and Dennis Mitchell and the Office of the Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement for co-sponsoring. The United States is a country marked by change and dynamism. However, we continually fight against white supremacy, anti-Black racism, hate, and violence. We find ourselves as a nation and a community once again on the precipice of change. The trial will end. The jurors are currently deliberating, though I hear soon to share a verdict, and we will learn how they rule in this case shortly. This is a historic moment we are witnessing, rife with complications and tensions, some of which we've just spoken about. The work of racial justice and authentic inclusion is a life's work. It's challenging work and it can also be deeply uncomfortable, but it is on all of us to be leaders and active participants working together. Please know that we at University Life are committed to continuing both conversations and action steps to keep our community moving in the direction of anti-racism and inclusion. I want to thank everyone for joining today. Take care. <laughs>